I think the first thing that is worth thinking about when we talk about a professional is actually what do we mean by a professional because that word is used in, in many contexts and I think it's a very confusing one. So for example, if you just had your kitchen painted as we have, um, you could say, or somebody comes in and says, well that, that's done, clearly done by a professional, it's really well painted and there's, there's something going on there. Or um, if you're a golf fanatic, you'll say, well, so-and-so is a particularly good professional golfer, and that, that's, that's a different component. Or you might say that that cardiac surgeon, surgeon is a true professional. And I think that word, what is going on, it's to do with the concept of, there's a thing about training. Um, some things that uh, you and I, with a bit of luck, could do, we, I suspect after a certain time, we'd become reasonable house decorators. Uh, but we'd still be seen as a professional house dragon. But it's something that most people in the street could learn how to do. I think there are other occupations where we use the term professional. So, for example, you can be a professional golfer because you're absolutely brilliant and you're one in the 10 million who can do it. But you don't necessarily have to understand the theory of why a golf ball flies through the air so far and it goes that way rather than that way. There's no uh, need for a theoretical understanding. They're still professionals. But if you look at something like a cardiac surgeon, they go undertake a long period of training. That seems to be very, very important. And what they do is not something that the man in the street could do. They're doing something different, something very skilled. Uh, and we often call that a body of knowledge. And indeed, to be something like a cardiac surgeon, you don't just have to work out you know, how to do it, perform the operating theatre. You have to understand the theory and knowledge of whatever cardiac surgeons get up to. So I think there's something very different there. So, when we talk about this area, I think we've got to be clear what we're talking about. I think it's also worth lobbying in another term, and that's an occupation. There are individuals who are licensed, who are regulated, who are clearly not professionals. There's something different. I would say the fundamental difference there is the period of training those individuals. So society in many countries will license or, or, or regulate an individual who is only doing a very short period of training. They're not professional, but there's something out there. Now, you have society, you have the profession, and I think both groups have obligations. Society, I believe, has an obligation to have good legislation, good regulations, so that the professionals can deliver. And if that legislation is bad, it goes horribly wrong, it doesn't work. <coughs> but on the other side of that equation, we expect those professionals to do certain things because we are giving them a privilege. We're giving them a huge economic privilege. We're also giving them a status as well. Um, and if you look at the how society is structured, and that, that obligation between what society gives the professional and what the professional gives back to society has got to be in balance. And if it's not in balance, it goes horribly wrong. And then, in a sense, parallel that equation, you've got, I think, what I would call the benefits of regulation, and you've got the disadvantages. Now, the benefits for the man in the street, if you, let's say, take the cardiac surgery, is, in the jargon, it's an asymmetrical knowledge base. I haven't got a clue what a cardiac surgeon does. I have got no idea if it's good, bad, or indifferent. But because they're professionals, because they do something different, I can trust them. Also, uh, in terms of professionalism, you often get professionals where the costs of mistakes are very, very large or you can't undo them. And the citizen gets a huge benefit because of the guaranteed quality standards. On the other side of the disadvantage, clearly there's the economic ones, but also you get things like furtherance of self-interest. Is the profession doing this because it's good for the man in the street, or are they doing it because, frankly, it's really good for them, cuts out competition? We've got to think about that. And lastly, you get, there's a, there's a whole lot of ranges I'm going to skimming over the top, but you also get the issues about inflexible workforces. You are, you know, if you end up like a sort of 1950s uh, ship, ship uh, construction site where the lead rights can do one thing and the carpenters can do something, it's bad news. First of all, often professionals are providers of intangible services. It's not products they're giving you. It's something out there which uh, is quite difficult to, to work out if you're a consumer what actually you're purchasing what you're getting. They also are individuals who sometimes deliver a service where there is guaranteed failure of that service. But if you think about a civil, uh, sorry, a, a criminal court case, you get two lawyers. One of them is going to lose. It's rather unusual, but we buy that we use those services. A bit of professional will provide that service, even though you know there's a 50% chance that there's going to be complete failure of that service on one side. Um, I've talked about the long period of specialised training, and some of that training, if you take a veteran architect, we're talking seven, eight years of training. That's the basic training, let alone any specialisation. And therefore, that, that I think is one of the, the behaviours we see from individuals who are prepared to put that huge amount of investment in training. 
Training again, it not, tends not to be just theoretical, it's a work-based training. So you're looking at individuals who have bought into the concept really of, of apprenticeship type training they go through. It's also something where examinations and qualifications is part of that profession. So they will say to you, I can do X or I can do Y because I've gone through this process of education and I can demonstrate I can do it because I've got this bit of paper, I, mm. I, I do that. Somebody who hasn't got that sort of background, I think we normally say they're not a professional, they're not exhibiting those sort of standards. They also have a, uh, a very, I think, an important thing. It's about the, uh, what was, I would call the autonomous application of standards. They make the decision what they're going to do. That professional knows what to do, and it's up to them to make that decision. It's like challenging if they work in teams, but they may do. And the classic case where it went all horribly wrong is if you run the clock back to the 1970s and 1980s, where essentially the medical profession in, in the Soviet Union was captured by the state, and you've got doctors putting people in psychiatric hospitals who did not have psychiatric problems. Fundamentally, that autonomy had completely broken down. <coughs> They're also keepers of secrets. When you go and see the doctor or when you go and see the, the accountant and talk about your, your tax schemes, the deal is that they don't tell anybody else. So, and if they uh, get them considered the ethical standards, somebody who breaks that trust, who hasn't exhibited that behaviour, often that is fundamentally a reason why they will no longer be, an, uh, be, be a professional. And lastly, I think there's the concept of altruism. They act in your interest, they don't act in their interest. Uh, that's absolutely fundamental to, I think, a professional. So whether that's the advice they give you on tax planning or the advice about which operation to have or the downside if you've got this particular horrendous disease, they are making decisions which are beneficial to you and it doesn't beneficial that individual. So they don't say, buy this bit of kit because I get much more commission on it. They say, buy this package because it's the best one. <coughs> the number of times I hear in feedback from general counsel from um, chief financial officers and so on, that they're tired of sitting down with partners who the partners say they want to come in and talk to them about their business. And then what happens instead is that the client says, I'm sick of seeing these partners, looking at their eyes and knowing that they're not listening, they're just waiting to talk. And it seems to me that this is a fundamental challenge which uh, professionals across the board uh, have to address that they have so much training, that their expertise is so great, that they have this autonomy, all these essential issues <coughs> could potentially be creating a problem with that interface or that behaviour between the professional individual and the individual consumer. And one of the questions we ask in the focus groups which I've observed, and it's still early days in research, is what are the characteristics of professions or occupations that you trust? We can actually tick off against uh, Mark's checklist. So the ones I noted down just sitting in the corner of a focus group group were public service oriented, not entirely profit driven, <coughs> caring, skilled, knowledge based, accountable, and having a good personal experience. Uh, and separate researchers ask consumers um, what gives you confidence in markets? And the most important thing is um, a feeling that the rules, the system is there to protect them in case something goes wrong. Um, I had an operation on the 21st of December, and I had the same operation two years prior to the 21st of December 2012. So I went back to my doctor and I said, I seem to have the same problem with my leg. And he said, he looked at me and he said, well, that's strange, Mr. Fox, because we did the operation and you should be fine. And he put me on the scanner and he said, oh, he said, um, well, obviously I made a mistake. And I said, what do you mean you made a mistake? He said, well, you're not... You're not, you don't come off a produ production line. You're not a finished, you know, you're different. Everybody's unique. And I haven't quite done what I thought I'd done. So I'm afraid you're gonna have to come back in and I'll have another go. And to me, that honesty that he, you know, straight up front with me, he, I don't know whether he'd made a mistake or not, but he said, I've made a mistake. And I said, I run a cancer practice. We do make mistakes. And we're up front straight away. The professional also, I think, has to be prepared to, you know, say, I'm sorry, we, we really didn't, we didn't do what we said we would do. Um, the issue that we're facing is people are very trained technically, but interestingly, all of you have cited the behavior rather than the training as the, the, the primary component that creates trust. Um, that is absolutely what we see in our work at CMI. Um, most people don't trust uh, 
the institutions in our society, whether they're the health institutions or the media or businesses or banks, um, and the simple reason why they don't trust them is they don't trust the behaviors they see. And it's interesting because we are all not only, um, um, if you like, receivers of these behaviors, but we're participants in them. Everybody, I imagine, around this table manages people. Now, how you manage those people and how you behave toward them is going to be the primary determinant of the degree to which they trust you and actually how they respond will determine whether you trust them. So I think it's very, very important that we try to bring these standards of professionalism into our behavior as, as managers, whether we are in healthcare, whether we are in media, whether we are in business. We can certainly um, agree a set of behaviours that we believe are going to exhibit and demonstrate trust and that we build that relationship. And there's the part where somebody just stands in front of you. And I was asking some of my colleagues yesterday, you know, um, what makes you trust somebody? And one individual said, um, well, I started to describe some behaviour. I said, do you mean sort of confidence? And they said, yes, but not too much confidence. And the other person said, well, I don't trust somebody until it's demonstrated it's proven to me. So there's that propensity to trust which I think influences our behaviour. I mean, certainly the media has a role, particularly when we get some of the major breakdowns in trust that have happened over the last uh, few years to a, to a number of professions, my, my own included. Um, once journalists get the scent of a good story, they, the breakdown in trust, because of the damage that does to individual relationships that are direct affected housing ordinary people, they make very good stories. But of course, it's in the journalist's interest, it's in the media's interest often to build those up to make them sound more exciting perhaps than they actually are in reality um, in order to sell more newspapers. That's not helped these days either with the much more adversarial relationship you often get between public relations people who are often end up managing these things perhaps far too early. And I mean, several of you have mentioned the importance of, uh, of honesty um, and, and almost confessional between a professional uh, and clients. When that goes behind the PR barrier, that often makes it much more difficult um, for the journalist to get the information. It also makes it much more exciting for the journalist to get that information, much more interesting for the chase. At the end of the day, we all quite enjoy that kind of chase, and that's one of the reasons very often people become journalists. They like exposing that kind of thing. And if they feel they have to dig for it, it's obviously much more important, much more of a secret. And very often PR people might be much better by being more forthcoming. So we do have a part to play in that. And I think actually the most damaging area is around politics and the mistrust of politicians, for instance. Partly their own fault, but it's also because journalists get into uh, what, what an American academic called the spiral of cynicism you just follow this track downwards where the politicians are not prepared to admit to mistakes, they're not prepared to admit to changing their minds. I mean, we all do this all the time. That's part of proper development and several of you already mentioned it. But politicians are scared to do that because it will make them look weak, uh, not make them look good leaders. But of course, that means people end up mistrusting them. And yes, the media does have a role in that. If you take professionals and... and try and get the evidence of why somebody becomes a professional and what they do. And there's, uh, there's a lot of lack of evidence in this particular area of <coughs> the work that we're doing is that to become, say, a physiotherapist, a profession that we're all pretty familiar with, they have a high reputation. But that individual to become a physiotherapist is, first of all, motivated pre-school. Uh, at school, they get selected to go to university, so you meet people out there. They then have three years of very intense training, and it's an apprenticeship, and one of the key things they are doing is becoming a professional. Some of them don't make it, uh, when the, and they learn from their peers, they learn from the academics, and when they then become a professional, there's huge peer pressure in how you behave, how you function. And this is not something that's imposed on them by the chief executive. It's not something that most people can do, it's very tough. But that whole concept of professionalism is a very slow process. And I believe certain professions become professions because of that process. When we talk about banking and codes of conduct, I, there's the you know, highway code, that is a code of conduct in terms of how we drive. It is a completely separate thing. 
And the idea that bankers are professionals and this concept of a physiotherapist, if they are chalk and trees, we're not talking about the same thing. And I think industries who <coughs> think that they can write a code and issue it to people and this is going to change behaviour, is you're going to be disillusioned. It just won't happen. And um, I think we've got to separate these two things. Um, and when we talk about professionalism, we've got to think, what are we talking about? Indeed, when professionalism goes wrong, and with the groups I deal, most of the things go wrong are not the, the, the skills and competences, it's the behaviour, mm -hmm. it's communication, it's treating patients with dignity, it's boundary issues, it's sleeping with patients. That's where it all goes wrong, and that's what professionalism is around. If we take that and try and pose it on journalists or on bankers, it's just make-believe, it's a complete and utter waste of time, and won't work. At CMI, we've looked at some of the management megatrends that actually work to do that. Um, uh, this is uh, to, to Miran's point. One is um, more diversity, okay? So because diversity um, uh, begets better, um, um, more ethical decision making in organizations at the top. There are a lot of studies. It also, by the way, benefits the bottom line. Um, the notion that somehow commercialism and ethics are divorced from each other, I disagree with. Um, uh, performance commercially is actually often much better in more ethical companies, sustainable performance, um, because you don't fall off the cliff like markets. Uh, so more diversity. Um, the other thing is bringing your ethics to work with you. Individuals at home have more care. We've talked about the ethic of care. You know, if you would uh, bring your ethics to work, and not leave that care ethic at home, that would help. So that's a trend. Uh, uh, being more collaborative as opposed to competitive. Think about the communities, uh, the way in which the web is organized. You know, what we really need is management 2.0, which is using the same principles of the web. Greater transparency, greater agility, greater collaboration, greater community. Um, and the last trend is moving away from these controlling cultures at the top to more collaborative, more participative. Again, that's a web value. So I think there are a number of very real steps we can make to change culture. It won't happen overnight, but you know, it's not beyond the, the, the realm of human endeavor. <laughs> Losing trust can be done at one catastrophic stroke, uh, the, the Savile case or, or uh, the Millie Dowler phone hacking, uh, or of course all the examples from, from many of your industries. And I think it would be foolish to assume that we can have one big drive which would rebuild that trust. That, that is not how those things happen. We've certainly heard some of the uh, things, I think Steve said, about having an effective regulator as a builder for trust, and that's something that uh, many of us are involved with at the moment, trying to rebuild our regulators to try uh, and in, uh, get people to accept that we now have effective regulation. Um, it's a matter of disappointment to me personally that my own industry is fighting uh, elements of the Leveson inquiry, and that just seems to me to be foolishness, because we're talking about angels dancing on the heads of, of pins now and it would be much more sensible just to say well let's go for what Leveson is saying we can then say to people look we have an effective <coughs> regulator we have turned over a <coughs> leaf we have a major start and that would be one way for those papers who are, that are right down the bottom of the league um, to start moving forward a bit we also need to, re to remember and again several of you have already mentioned this that it's actually in our best interest not just personally because if we behave responsibility, uh, responsibly, let them our own profession will be much stronger for it. But also commercially, it is to do with the long haul. You, you, you don't get immediate turnarounds in profits in the very short term by being um, trustworthy, by doing the kinds of things that we've been talking about. But I certainly believe that you do in the long term because clients come with you, because they will stay with you because they understand that you are doing the very best you can for them. The minute they learn that they're doing, that you're doing the very best for you and not for them is when they pull away. So whilst you might make short-term profits, those do not stay uh, for very long. I know the banking industries particularly had problems with that over the last couple of years, but, but they're certainly not alone, and I'm not pointing fingers particularly. It's interesting at the macro level we talk about professional or occupation and the idea of trust. But some of what you said there is we build trust with people. 
We might have a perception that a particular industry or profession is trustworthy or not, but assuming that that person gets in the door and engages in the conversation for whatever reason, we are then totally influenced by the relationship and behaviours between those two people. So we almost have to make our own personal commitment to developing trust and the skills and qualities that create that. And when it has broken down, my experience is, whilst we might be trained professionally to deal with something in a certain procedural way, when something goes wrong, we don't have an alternative way of behaving. We don't know how to have that conversation that we know we should have, that we're avoiding having, having which actually reduces the trust even further. And people say, well, we're less sort of deferential to professionals than we used to be. We uh, participate in TripAdvisor and other sorts of forums where we leave comments about the experience that we've had. People also say that the world is more business-minded, uh, that people care less. And it's not the individual's fault, it's the system's fault. But I don't see many of those trends reversing. We live in a market economy. Um, the law is a market now. Medicine is more moving towards a market. It's difficult for the system re to reverse back to an individual level. So surely the challenge has, how do we reassert professional values in the modern world, accepting that we can't go back to the past? We're absolutely clear that there's just been too many incidents that have, have, have shown that there's been inappropriate behaviour in the banking industry. But I think we've come to the view, and it's almost, um, I was going to say this on the last session, you know, when you've seen very clear um, uh, breach of, of confidence and trust and inappropriate behaviour, I think there comes a point where the light bulb switches on and you realise that you've got to take some quite... Uh, novel and unique action in order to show that actually we do get that something's wrong here and willing as an industry to try and deal with that. Um, that's certainly where I think we are. Well, one of the things that, that I do find quite interesting, there was a survey uh, for YouGov recently and it was published in the British Journalism Review and it concentrates on uh, a number of professions but particularly newspapers. But the interesting part is the discrimination that ordinary people are able to bring to their judgments of who to trust and, and who not to trust. And I'll just read very quickly some of the key ones. Family doctors apparently top the league at 87% and school teachers are at 76%. But just to concentrate on, on journalists, just to show this level of discrimination, BBC News journalists uh, are trusted by 61% of people, although whether this was done before the Savile revelation or not, it, I, I'm not certain. ITV news journalists are 10% down on that at 51, uh, alongside Channel 4 uh, news journalists. Journalists on upmarket newspapers are 43%, are and journalists on local papers 40%. So it's still quite a reasonable level of trust for journalists who we would all see uh, as being in fairly serious news organisations, ones that, that make uh, a real attempt. Journalists on mid-market papers, though, this is uh, the Mail and the Express, only 18% and red tops 15%. And I, I doubt if many of us would, would disagree too strongly with those kind of figures. But it does show the level of discrimination. People are able to make value judgments around this, and that, that gives me considerable hope for the future. When brands let us down, we um, quickly change our behavior. So we only need to think of um, Toyota, you know, standing for quality for years. Quality falters, people desert Toyota, Toyota and they lose their market leadership. Um, I think professions can learn from how brands are managed. Um, you know, you do need to have sustainable values. They do need to be open and honest. Um, they do need to have a sense of purpose. They do need to have a benefit for your consumer. And you do need to connect with that consumer um, in a real way. Brands that do that well, professions that do that well, managers that do that well, organizations that do that well, are getting a lot right. And I guess the point is, we can train that as individuals. You know, we look at this and think, you've either got it or you don't. That's not true. Um, these behaviors can be trained. So to all of you that are wondering, how do I do this stuff? You know, you can, you can train yourself, you can train your people. What is a brand? in professionals because Mark you talked at the start about how professional professionalism if you like is often dealing in intangibles and I think that's where one of the key differences between professions and say Toyota or something like that and there isn't a, a tangible thing you can put on the table and say 
this is us, judge us by that. It is behaving, it is holy behaving. When I approached this question, I spent many happy hours looking at learned portals, erudite writings, I even found myself looking at the Bible. Um, but I ultimately found myself looking at the 15-point plan of what to do when there's been a breach of trust uh, and how to put it right on Wikipedia. Uh, so this might be a bit less intellectual perhaps than I thought it might originally have been. I'd hope to be talking to you about concepts of presumptive contracts with professionals and society and the Merison Commission, and, but now I'm going to talk to you about the 15-point plan. So the first one is uh, professionals have got to recognise the importance of the special place that they occupy. Um, and lots has been written about this, about the sacred territory, and we've touched on some of that in terms of the, the confidentiality of dealings uh, with, with patients in the healthcare professions, uh, the operation of autonomy, the application of specialist skills and training. Um, but the recognition of the importance of what we're doing seems to be at the heart of somehow taking the personal professional accountability that the public and society expect us to take as a professional across all disciplines. The other uh, factor, number two on my list, so we've got the importance of being where you are. Number two is the importance of taking the blame, not just for your actions, but for the actions of others. To me, I think that that is really at the heart of taking leadership responsibility and somehow validating uh, those sort of special qualities and a special place that, that we sometimes occupy in our professional lives. That's number two, taking the blame. Number three, trying to make sure that things don't happen again. And not just things that you've done, but the things that others have done. And sometimes things that you may have had no part of at all. And it goes back, I think, to the broader concepts of, of social responsibility and how far we have a duty, in effect, to police ourselves. And we see many um, of the inquiries that have emerged in terms of some of the healthcare work that I've been involved in previously, where the responsibilities and duties of professionals working alongside others um, puts them in a very difficult position. Uh, and they find themselves in a position where they have to report their peers, their superiors, and they have to stand up and be counted because they see things going wrong. Number four, doing things, actually being judged by your deeds and your actions, not just talking about things. So very positive, demonstrable outcomes of what you do. So it's something very, very visible. And there's quite a lot been written about how a lot of what professionals do is actually invisible. You may have had your operation, it may be visible, it may be invisible. But so there's this invisible world, and by virtue of that invisible world, there has to be a requirement for them to be demonstrable outcome and deeds. Number five. Oh, number five? Yes, number five. The ability to allow the passage of time and be patient. Interesting concept. Sometimes, when there has been a fundamental breach of trust, it's going to take time and the passage of time to build that bridge and to repair whatever's gone wrong. And many professionals, I think, are very impatient about this. They don't want to give people the time, the space, the communication that might be required for them to somehow understand what's happened and be able to rationalise it. Number six, the ability to self-sacrifice. So not putting yourself first, putting yourself last, allowing others to take the lead. To be able to delegate tasks to individuals who are nurturing and training and to actually oversee them and to take accountability for them when it might go wrong. It's very brave. I've lost my numbers, but I know there's 15 at the end. <laughs> the operation of insight to deploy your powers of emotional and intellectual intelligence to develop insight and analysis into what's happened and what's going on in your professional world. <coughs> the next one's interesting, the ability to be creative and to actually think about solutions to circumstances and events that others may not have thought about, or even if they have thought about them, to maybe find a rather different way of getting there. Back to a healthcare setting, I found myself in charge of a hospital in South East London one night. I worked as a nurse uh, in my early career, and I found a lady in labour in our casualty department. We didn't have a maternity unit. Her baby was going to be premature. I needed an incubator from the central London hospital. I rang the London Ambulance Service. They said, no, they weren't going to be able to do it. They were overrun. 
I rang Scotland Yard and asked to speak to the most senior officer available to me at two o'clock in the morning. And 25 minutes later, I had an incubator arrive at my hospital uh, with a blue light escort. Got into a bit of trouble, <laughs> um, but the baby um, survived. Uh, so that's my creative example. The ability for you to surrender your own privacy. So to tell people the truth, the complete truth, even things that perhaps are very, very precious and close to you, such as your health problems, psychiatric difficulties, family problems. The ability to surrender that special space. Wide engagement to draw other people into your world. Not to work in isolation, to submit yourself to peer review and feedback and to act on it. The ability to make amends, to somehow think about restitution and redress. The ability to truly apologise. The S word is not easy for everybody to say. To be specific, not to talk in generalisation, to give technical detail where appropriate and to condition it to your audience. The ability to ask for forgiveness and to accept it when it's given. And finally, to accept that there are some circumstances where that trust and that breach of trust is irreparable. I mean, I, I hope that trust is irreparable, and that means for the individual rather than the organisation, otherwise the consequence of failure is just too, too, too dramatic. But I think I've heard an awful lot around the table um, that, I, that, that I'd agree with. Um, over at the BBA, we're subject to a parliamentary commission at the moment, looking into professional standards in banking. Um, and what we try to do is get a better understanding of what we think works, what we think doesn't work, and actually look to see if there's any gaps. And I think some of the what we've identified as gaps somehow ties into some of what I've just heard, in that um, banking is a, 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 a regulated uh, industry. Uh, we already have the Financial Services Authority about to be divided into two, specific conduct authority. Um, we already have many professional institutes and educational bodies and so on that are applying standards at an individual level. Um, but in determining whether we can just you know, somehow try and improve what's already there or whether there's something missing, we've been listening to an awful lot of people. Um, and I think one of the things that, that um, was particularly impressed upon me was evidence provided by an ex-CEO of, of a bank, uh, Martin Taylor, who actually said he'd looked at some of this and although part of the answer could be applying professional standards and applying a professional code to an individual in a commercial environment, um, what didn't really work was to get somebody to sign some kind of code on a Monday if you then put them as an organisation under the wrong incentive structure on a Tuesday. And so what we've looked at is um, really what's already there. And in fact, only last week we presented to Parliament what we think is the answer for banking. I'm not suggesting it's the... Uh, the answer for everybody, but certainly what we see is absolutely fundamental is the regulated part. We have something called the approved persons regime. Um, there's 156,000 people in financial services already covered by that regime. There are some gaps, but rather than thinking that it doesn't work, well, deal with the gaps and actually give the regime a bit more bite. And in fact, some of that's work in progress because we have had uh, already a, a two or three banking and financial services um, act over the last two, three years, and the regulators was given more powers in 2010, but it takes time to, to feed through. We also have all of that work from the um, institutes and the educational bodies, and in fact, under a different initiative, anybody, for example, acting in a position of investment advice will be required to be qualified and to, 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 to be um, subject to ongoing professional requirements in a way that they weren't previously, and that applies to something like 30,000 people. But we still thought there was a gap. And the gap that I saw really was, was summed up by the evidence session of Martin Taylor, where he said, but what, what if you then put people in an incentive structure the following day that doesn't fit? And I think for me, I kind of thought there was, if, if we're thinking about a triangle here with the regulator there, an individual professional standards, uh, I actually looked at this and came to the view that, that what was missing 
was something that applied at the board and senior management level. Because at the end of the day, I think when it comes to the large organisations that tend to work in, in financial services, um, it's the boards themselves that are responsible for that culture and ethos. And we were very keen that um, you know, we gave full support and looked at what more you could do with the um, approved persons regime and also with, with individual professional standards, but very keen to see something like uh, the development of a universal code that would apply across all employees working in banking. Again, it, it, it's quite difficult. I think at times people have blurred you know, the, you know, the difference between what is a professional in banking and what is an occupation. I think, I think some of those distinctions are very really real. But I think that, that, that in terms of an occupation, as I've heard it described today, I could envisage a code that would apply across banking. Um, it wouldn't just be retail banking, it would be the markets in London, uh, it would be a price of doing business here. And I think that I could see that we would either have a new regulator, or a new body rather, uh, a new standards body, that actually would be responsible for making sure that organisations signed up to that. That new body could either sit within one of the existing regulators, if one of the existing regulators wants to step forward and say, we'd be very happy to do that, then I think that would be a good mechanism. I'd want to see it slightly distanced from the regulatory um, uh, responsibilities, because I think there's something about culture and ethos that shouldn't be just about trying to meet the bare minimum of what the regulator's looking for. You should be actually trying to create a positive environment. And I think that the much of, of what I've heard is all about, you know, I think it's been described as the tone at the top. You set the tone at the top, and then what you really do want to see is that the board and senior management take responsibility for whatever those values and expectations are. And it is very much about behavior, I think, rather than professionals. You want to see that trickle all the way down and all the way through the organization and permeate it through every single action that your employees take. Well, it's, it is very interesting because a lot of what you've said, the themes of what you've said about uh, positive behavior, um, starting at the top of an organization, the importance of uh, managers taking um, the accountability and the responsibility for um, the mistakes as well as the um, uh, positive outcomes, and, um, um, and the responsibility for things that go wrong further down. Those are the things that we know work. My firm has been going for 160 years, and my longest standing client has been with the firm, I think, over 100 years. It's what we do primarily with families. And, you know, the short term relationships are not what we're interested in at all. It's long term relationships. And it, I, I talk to my clients and I say, in effect, we're, like, we're married to each other. And, and sometimes we. Sometimes we love one another, sometimes we fall out with one another, sometimes we, 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 might, we might fall out but we come back together. You know, it really is very, very important and what, I try, what I'm hearing is, you know, it is, it is really about the person at the top setting the tone and certainly my style of management, um, for which I have been criticised sometimes, is I try and open up, not just with my Plants, but with my with my with my staff, and so they can see the the real human. And I think it's easy for me because I've only got five hundred people. If I was running Barclays, how do how do you get that across to all of those people? Um, I don't, I really don't know. I, I I couldn't begin to to understand how to do that. But to me, um, you know, in this world at the moment, I think you can get everything quick, cheap fairly nasty, um, you press a button and you can search anything you want to do. And I think there's a real opportunity to return to traditional, dare I say, and when I say to many of my clients, if, if you want, I mean, it was interesting, I, I, I went to get my eyes tested the other day and somebody said, we can, we can prepare your glasses in an hour. And I said, I'm not interested in my glasses being done in an hour. I want them right. I'm prepared to wait. And I think you know, in, in, there's something there that return to tra traditional business values, it's not quick and cheap and commercial. Um, you know, we, we, we turn away many people. We say, I'm sorry, it, it, it's not something we can do for you. And I think that setting the tone at the top, being human, being approachable, being open, 
um, you know, being a real person is, is absolutely key. Well, we've had a fascinating discussion and I'm ever so grateful to you all for your contributions.